My name is Greg Brannon. I'm uh, running for the United States Senate. It's an honor delivering babies. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I was raised by a single mom. I was the first person in my family to go to college. She raised my brother and myself. She was very simple. She said, go to church, go to school, or kick your rear end. And I was very fortunate to be the first person in my family to go to college. My dream from day one was to be a doctor. And uh, by God's grace, I ended up becoming an obstetrician gynecologist. Uh, my brother ended up becoming an, an attorney. So my mom got us to live the American dream. And but the blessing of seeing life in the mode, you know, from conception to, to actually delivery is just a phenomenal. And then to see that life in the female all the way to there as they mature is just a great race. And I, I love it. I've delivered over 9,000 babies. My wife and I, we married 26 years this Thursday. We have seven children, six girls and a boy. My daughters range from uh, four, six, eight, 16, 18, and 23. My boy's 21. I love family. Our life revolves around the dinner table. That's very important to us. Uh, we, my wife and I have done that from day one where I have lunch together and dinner together. Um, the reason why I'm doing this, because I love my family so much that if this generation, I don't pass on the work ethic and fighting for liberty, I'm passing on a less free America. My mom's passion for this country, my mom's passion for what this country is all about. For many, one, the idea of uh, that many cultures form the American culture and that under the rule of law, we're all, we're all equal. And that's interesting. My mom, a single mother, raised by a, my grandfather and grandfather, or it was my favorite, my grandfather was a Democrat. My mother ended up becoming a Republican. She loved her man, Ronald Reagan. She loved that kind of passion. She saw the instills of the, of the can-do attitude. She was actually a, a secretary during the uh, Apollo race to space. And that passion of the American dream sort of vision during the 60s and me being a little kid there. So the big thing I told before was, I mean, her rules were simple. She understood, she was, Greg, I don't care what you are, doesn't matter what job you do, just give all you got and be an honest man. About five, six years ago, with clear as a bell, I knew I was meant to do this. Because when you start looking at the rhetoric, never matched up to the functions. The Constitution is six pages long, six pages. That our founders, who 11 years before that did the Declaration, who pledged their life, their fortune, their honor, did they really do all that for the country we have today? We have leaders today mention the word democracy, the collective. No, sir. We're the first and only government based upon the individual over the collective in the form of a republic. Not a democracy. A republic, we're all free under the rule of law. Today, we're the rule of men. And if this generation, if this generation does not stand up, we're going to pass on a less free America. I think it's our obligation. Where do you stand on that topic as far as defunding Obamacare or moving forward? And what do you ultimately think is the solution both to Obamacare and the health care in this, uh, I should say, health care crisis in this country? I'll go backwards first. Okay. The health care crisis because the government got involved in a free market apparatus. Government caused the problem. They caused the problem because we allowed them to do unenumerated functions. There's no health care in Article 1, Section 8. And this delineation of if you defund or not defund shows our representatives who understand the Constitution and who does not understand the Constitution. Article 1, Section 7, Clause 1 clearly states all appropriations of the House. For those who say for political reasons or it can't be done because of this, that, that other thing shows clearly they do not understand the oath they took on the piece of paper they swore to uphold. The Constitution is clear. And I can get into the history if you want to. The history of the conventions were clear. Um, I happen to read all 13 states, the conventions, and the Philadelphia conventions. Our state in Hillsborough in 1788 was one of the best conventions actually delineated it. The Federalists who wanted the Constitution actually went clause by clause for over three weeks answering the NFL's questions. And one of them was actually that question, was actually saying which house is more powerful, the chamber for the Senate or the chamber for the people in the House. And he said clearly, Iredell said clearly it's the House because they control the purse strings. It's actually their obligation to defund unconstitutional acts. So I take it then that, that your ultimate goal would be to just completely eliminate Obamacare? Oh, yes, sir. Because it's not a federal function. The Constitution is a contract between 13 sovereign states, now 50, that tells the federal government what 18 functions they can do, broken to defense and free trade. That's all. 
The Bill of Rights is not a list of rights the, con the government was kind of give, it, give us. It's a list of God-given natural rights in which they can never infringe upon. The first natural right is self-defense. Congress has no, have no opinion on this. They cannot make law to regulate anything. The role of the Second Amendment is twofold, self-defense and to protect the states from the government. Twofold here. The most important thing is we need a constitutional dollar. In the Constitution, it says all money must be backed by gold or silver. We've left that, we have fiat currency. By not knowing our history, it allowed this dollar to grow, become fiat currency, which is worthless. From 1792 to 1913, our dollar increased roughly 17% in value backed by gold. With a fiat currency, we went down about 98% since 1913. So the question is, what did our founders put down on a piece of paper? Actually, on August 16th of 1787 in Philadelphia, they actually voted fiat currency backed by air or gold. It was nine to two gold. The Coinage Act of 1792 actually put down the actual measurements of the grains of silver for a dollar for a silver dollar and the grains of gold for gold. So the and it's actually punishable by death if you try to clip it. We've left these, this hard currency because we've left our gold standard, our constitutional standard. So how do you fix this uncontrolled debt? You get back to a dollar that's worth a dollar, and history has proven that. Then you get rid of departments that are not constitutional. If they're not there, they must go away. Where do you stand on the farm bill? What do you think is the best way forward with that bill? And do you support cutting either of those benefits, either to farmers or to the, the SNAP program? I'm gonna go back to history. When Madison was discussing in Philadelphia an example between a federal function and a state function, the first example he used was agriculture. He said agriculture will never be a federal function, it's a local issue. So here we go again, we're taking our plunder that's taken from us as individuals, forming it to the government, and the government is now keeping itself in power by giving these goodies away. The answer is the Department of Agriculture should go away at the federal level. And now 80% of the farm bill was food stamps. That enslaves people. What you want to do is, it's, it's, it's crazy, but it's true, teach people to fish instead of giving them fish. When you're in the behest of somebody else, you're, you're actually in a slavery to them. So we have to understand, we don't need to have the government come in. That kind of charity it does not make people freer. Transitioning to foreign policy real fast, President Obama recently asked for a resolution authorizing military action in Syria before pulling it off the table because of a Russian plan that will allow the UN to seize control of, of the Syrian uh, chemical weapons. What is your opinion of the way the president handled that situation? And if you were a U.S. senator and that resolution had come before you, what would have been your vote? I would have voted no. It's unconstitutional. Declaring war is in the power of Article 1, Section 8 again in the House. The idea of who declares war again was discussed in depth in Philadelphia. And it was always going to be a defensive war, an Augustine type of war, where we are, we are, will be attacked or intimate threat. The president becomes commander in chief. This is Hamilton's paper, 69, when Congress, the people, declare war. Then he acts, according to Hamilton again, as the chief general or head admiral. He has no power to do that. So the answer I had to vote no. Okay, and I assume if, if, uh, if we change Syria to Iran or any other country, the, the answer would be the same. It's all American interest. The foreign policy that Greg Brown will do when I'm ambassador from our state is simple. It's articulated in George Washington's Farrell Address, paragraph 30 to 37, Jefferson and Madison the way they did it. You trade with everybody, have a strong defense, but we're going to ready to share our treasure and most importantly, our young's blood. You do not do it for trivial things. Yeah, I actually uh, wrote a paper on this about uh, three years ago. Well, I did some radio interviews about, about 18 months ago, and I was bringing up the idea of drones. In the act that passed, they want to have over 30,000 drones over America in the next seven years. That infringes on our Fourth Amendment. We are not the policemen of the world. The answer is no, not at all. If there's ways to use it legally in the sense of protection for our country and our aspects of that, but not spy on us, there might be a play for that, as Rand talked about. But to have just this idea of drones flying over 30,000 drones, some armed, some not, and then collecting that data, unacceptable. And then using it as a police for around the world, there's no such thing as collateral damage. Everything out there is a human being made in God's image. Two questions our founders had to ask, same question we have to ask today. Who is sovereign and what is a legitimate role of government? And both those are answered in the greatest piece of philosophy of government ever, our declaration, the second paragraph. It says, the first question is who's sovereign? It's actually you and me because we're, we're made in the Creator's image. So we are endowed with certain noble rights among those life, from the moment of conception to natural passing, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. 
A legitimate role of government is only legitimate if it protects those inalienable rights. The very next sentence says that. To secure those rights, the government instituted amongst men deriving their just powers from consent of the governed. And why is that crucial? Because the sovereign, you, acting on your sovereignty and your liberty, is giving the local government a little bit, allow you to live your rights. The moment it infringes on your individual rights, the moment it does, it becomes illegitimate. And then Jefferson articulated 28 functions that he called tyranny. So the answer is, I disagree with the premise in the sense of what the philosophy of government is. That's our answer. That is, that's why we're, that's why we're a republic, not a democracy, and the only one ever based upon the individual over the collective with the rule of law keeping us all equal under that. Bringing it back to you here, we talked a little bit before we, we started taping about uh, your schedule and, and all that you do, and you talked about uh, your, your practice, and you're even on call as we're recording this yes, sir. on call right now. One of the criticisms that I've heard from talking to people around the area about you is that they feel like you're not taking this serious because you haven't shut down your practice, and, and that's something that, that I'm, I'm actually, you know, I've heard from a number of different people. What What's your response to that? Do you feel like you need to shut down your practice to be able to do this? Uh, man, no work. Man, no eat. I'm not a rich man. I'm rich where I counsel with my seven children. I'd be irresponsible to shut down. A man who's not taking care of his family is worse, worse than anybody, according to scripture. My job is to put bread on the table for my family. Also, I got a skill set that's phenomenal. I love doing this, and that's why I'm running for Senate, because I love delivering the 9,000 babies I deliver. I love the, the trust people have with me, keeping my word and taking care of their lives from delivery till as they re go get older. I'm taking this seriously. I do everything 100%. I will show you from this interview I've prepared. This primary would be very clear on the only candidate, the only candidate prepared constitutionally, that understands the, the contract backwards and forwards, can tell you how to take the issues of today and think through the prism of why our founders fought that way, and then apply it with my oath. If you're looking for a surgeon, you're looking for a pilot, you're looking for one that knows a skill set, we're looking for trustees, unbiased umpires that will honor the contract. Most people are running for office wanted to enrich themselves. I showed you an example, I'm a full-time worker. I don't work, I cannot eat. I'm gonna be a servant citizen, give of my expertise. I studied extremely hard on the Constitution, extremely hard on what it means, and applied it the way it has to be applied. That document is different than any other document. It is living in the sense of because it's fixed. A contract allows the rule of law, to allow us to live our lives. The moment infringed upon that is now illegitimate. I believe, I will show in this race, that I'm a man of honesty, not perfect, honesty, and the skill set that I will show you. We're looking for constitutional trustees, and I'm that man. <laughs>